This video is brought to you by 3D Connection. This is the most complex robot arm that I've ever designed, but it's not good enough. You see, I'm building an animatronic Claptrap from Borderlands, and things aren't going too well. So that's where Claptrap was supposed to be, and that's where Claptrap is. I think uh, I'm gonna need to make some changes. But this is good news, because this crash means I get to redesign Claptrap to be even stronger and easier to repair. So, let's get started. Claptrap's arms are just over half a meter long, which means that every extra gram shaved off his hands reduces the stress on his shoulder motors. In V1, they were a little chunky, so I tapered them off and made the model more game accurate. I kept the gear teeth and the base, but instead of having the extension spring mount directly to the base of one hand, I've dropped it down into the forearm. This keeps it tucked away, but also makes assembly easier since I don't have to awkwardly screw it inside the wrist. Claptrap's hands in the game model are held on by the most flimsy little bent arms, and in V1, I had already made them symmetrical, but they were still way too delicate. So I joined them together with this little spar, and now they're much more resistant to twisting. I also removed the steel cable guide pins on the wrist. These were really only necessary in a prototype, as FDM parts are too rough, but the final wrist will be SLS nylon, so I've just added a big old smooth fillet to the guide hole for a gentle transition for the cable. V1 of Claptrap's hand was fixed to his forearm, but I want more expression, so I made more room in his arm assembly for another servo. So V3 has an actual wrist! The wrist rides on two bearings that mount to the tip of the forearm. There are symmetrical round channels for routing this one millimeter cable within the wrist. Each cable feeds through a channel and into a small hole. That hole lines up with the axle screw, so that when the wrist is screwed to the forearm, the cables are neatly secured and also easily removed. The new wrist is designed to move a full 180 degrees, and just like the hand, the wrist is spring-loaded. An identical spring will attach to one of the control cables, and the other will go to the drive servo. This way, I only have to route two control cables through his arm. For some reason, in V1, I kept printing the forearm bones in a vertical orientation, which was obviously weak. But I flattened out the sides and printed it out lengthwise. Thanks for the printer, Joe. So now they're incredibly tough, which means the bones can handle the weight of the hand. So I swapped out the tube in V1 for a thin rod in V3, which instead of aluminum tube can just be a decorative styrene rod. This rod also acts as a mounting shaft for the springs. I modeled a simple shaft collar that will ride on the rod. The screws that fix the collar to the rod will also be the mounting points for the wrist and hand springs, so I can tension or relax the springs just by adjusting the shaft collar. But now that the core of the forearm is in a tube, I need a place to route the hand and wrist control cables, and I've got the perfect option. Claptrap has these random red wires in his forearm, which previously would have just been decorative, but I designed my version with red PTFE tubes, so now the cables can be neatly routed through the forearm and into the elbow. Claptrap's elbow is one of the most fragile elements of his design. It has the smallest cross-sectional area of any part likely to take damage from a fall, which it totally did. So I've added a gusset along the length of the rod end. The rod end mounts into a clevis on the upper arm. The old clevis design also snapped at the first sign of stress, so I joined them together in a continuous curve. Is it game accurate? No. I'm sure you claptrap elbow purists are out there, but compromises have to be made, and if I hadn't pointed out the design change, would you have even noticed or cared? I also experimented with making the elbow magnetically coupled to the forearm, so that it could split apart without breaking. And while I do think that's a fun design, it didn't make the cut for V3. And that's not the only major change I've made to his elbow. In V1, I had a spring-loaded and cable-driven joint just like the hands, but I knew I could make the joint more compact. So instead of a shoulder-mounted servo with the cable, I tucked a little linear actuator inside his arm. I also shifted the axis of his elbow forward too, as the game model doesn't allow his arms to fold in much more than 90 degrees without clipping. With this linkage arrangement, he can flex an extra 45 degrees. 
You might notice that his arms don't fully extend, but that's not much of an issue, as Klepchop's arms are so long relative to his body that they would drag on the ground if they were completely relaxed at his sides, so he'll have to have his elbows bent most of the time anyway. The new upper arm is where the magic happens. Previously, the upper arm was just a dumb old tube, but look at all that wasted volume potential. Although I do want to keep the arms light, Moving the hand and wrist servos inside his bicep area makes assembly so much easier, as now the control cables don't have to awkwardly route through the shoulder. This also frees up more space inside the shoulder, which I'll take advantage of here in a second. I've effectively split the upper arm into three main components, the elbow clevis, the core tube, and the miter gear block. The clevis screws into the end of the tube. Tube acts as a mount for the linear actuator that pivots on a long set screw. The small dynamixel servos screw in from below, and the core tube screws into a hexagonal shaft that rests in the gear block. This assembly makes it easier to print and replace if any part of it gets damaged. This all seems well and tidy, but I still need to get power and data wires to the servos. Luckily, Claptrap's model includes this yellow wire sticking out of his arm. Like before, I thought this would just be decorative, but I found a way to make it functional. I'm already using these PC4 pneumatic connectors to connect PTFE tubes to provide a path for the arm and wrist control cables. And as luck would have it, I have this old multi-conductor spool cable that fits perfectly inside this connector. The cable comes out of the shoulder and wraps around the arm before running through this slot in the shoulder and inside his chassis. Now that is satisfying. The shoulder is where I spent most of my time optimizing the design into something I'm actually proud of. In V1, the drive motors for the arm differential were mounted to the chassis and connected to the differential gears via timing belts that were routed and tensioned through the arm mount plate. Despite their large size, the old drive motors weren't as powerful as you might think, and at over a kilogram each were a significant amount of extra weight. Having the motors mounted this way meant that the shoulder had only two degrees of freedom allowing it to rotate and rise up and down. But if I wanted a lightweight arm that could also move forward and back, I would need to rethink everything about the shoulder, and this is what I came up with. I designed the new shoulder assembly around this 75 millimeter inner diameter bearing. There's a large helical gear in this bearing that mates with a smaller helical gear that is driven by the pitch servo, which will allow the arm to move forward and back. Having the arm move this way means I need to make the differential servos way more compact. So instead of large motors fixed to the chassis, I'm using more compact drive servos integrated inside the diameter of this bearing. This was a tight fit, but there's enough room for them to tuck away neatly. And instead of this massive external bearing block for the differential, I designed an internal bearing block to rest between the gears. The arm weighs less than a kilogram, so there's no need for such a huge component or so many bearings. I also don't need a complex way to transfer power from the servos to the gears, so I've designed the gears with integrated pulleys. The pulleys are arranged in a 3 to 2 reduction, and since the output is the combined torque of the motors, that's actually a 66% increase in torque. The gears each have a 15 millimeter bearing that mounts on these components, which provide a stubby shaft for them to rotate on. Each block also provides a mounting spot for a small pulley, which keeps the cables within its profile and guides it to the motor pulley inside the shoulder gear. Now the shoulder has a full three degrees of freedom inside a compact package. In version one, I had to take off the side body panels, remove eight screws that attach the arm frame to the chassis, unscrew the sensors over the differential axle shafts so that I could slide those out, and then awkwardly untension and pull the timing belts through the frame just so that I could access the arm motors inside the shoulder. Needless to say, that's a nightmare, and I didn't even cover every detail to disassemble it, not to mention that all of that has to be done in reverse to reassemble it every time I want to access the shoulder. There has to be a better way, and there is. Now that all of the motors are in the arm or tucked away within the shoulder frame, I can make accessing it crazy easy. In V3, the entire arm is now held in by a single screw. One screw! It threads through the head and screws straight into a flange at the top of the arm frame. The entire arm frame is designed to rest and pivot on two screws at the base of the frame. The frame has two more screws that ride in channels that are part of the chassis. These channels keep the arm from simply falling out when the screw is removed, but when it is, I can simply tilt the whole arm in and lift it up and out in seconds. Oh, and I didn't forget about the electronics. I've designed the power and data wires for the servos to connect via these magnetic connectors. So when I pull the arm out, they detach too. 
That's all I've got for today. Thanks, as always, to my supporters over on Patreon, especially Adam759. You really are a war hero.